Okay, so now let's talk about translation. Now we're going to use the RNA transcript that we have created and processed to um, make some protein. So this occurs on the ribosomes and we have our mRNA which is essentially a RNA that contains the codons, that contains the sequence for our amino acids. Um, the RNA, which, um, I'm sorry, the ribosome, which is made of proteins and ribosomal RNA. And then our tRNA. So those are our three tRNAs involved um, that are going to get this job done. And of course the tRNAs are uh, carrying the amino acids <coughs> and the rRNAs make up the bulk of the ribosome that is the site of translation. Okay, so tRNAs have a particular sequence of, nucle of nucleotides. Um, at one end is where the amino acid is attached. At the other end is what's called the anticodon and the anticodon you may recall from freshman year, is a sequence of three bases that essentially match up with the codon on the mRNA. And so this ensures that the right tRNA is matching up with the mRNA and bringing in the correct amino acid. Here we just have three different ways of looking at tRNAs. This one, again, this has these basic sequence here and some hydrogen bonding going on, and then this middle one throwing, showing more of the three-dimensional shape, and then this sort of cartoonish image here that looks like a bent candle. All right, so the amino acids, um, this is how they're attached to the tRNAs. There's this enzyme, aminoacyl tRNA synthetase. It essentially grabs onto the amino acid, grabs onto the tRNA, and with some energy provided by ATP, it's able to bond that amino acid onto that tRNA. And so then so those tRNAs have their attached amino acid, they can travel over to the ribosome. And the ribosome consists of a large and small subunit and there's three different spots on the ribosome. Um, the A, the P, and the E. And um, the A site is sort of represented by the fact that the enzyme involved with uh, bonding the amino acid to the tRNA is an A, begins with an A. I sometimes just think of it as the attachment site. It's where the, amino, the tRNA first comes in when it's bringing its um, amino acid. The P site is when um, the amino acid that has been brought in is being attached to the growing polypeptide. And the E site is the exit site. That's when the tRNA has already given up its amino acid and it exits. So here's a more um, computer-generated three-dimensional look at it. Again, our blue or larger subunit and the smaller white one with the A, P, and E sites. Our mRNA being fed in. And you can see right here the ball of amino acids on our growing polypeptide that are then sticking out the top, you might say, of the ribosome. All right, so again, the correct anticodon on the tRNA has to match up with the codon on the mRNA. Um, so initiation is when all these players first get together. The small subunit, the large subunit, the mRNA, the first tRNA, which is going to code for our first amino acid, which will be methionine, that start codon. And then with elongation, essentially you can think of the mRNA as kind of moving through or the ribosome, or you might just say the ribosome is moving along the mRNA. And so we have our codon here that matches up with the tRNA in the middle that has added its amino acid to the growing polypeptide. And this one on the right essentially is waiting to be in that spot next. Once this middle one moves over to the east site, it'll be, uh, it'll exit the ribosome. It'll go off and grab another amino acid and bring it in. 
and then what happens is when you reach the stop codon, you don't have a tRNA that comes along because there's no tRNA that matches with that. You have this protein known as a release factor. That essentially says, okay, we're done with translation. The polypeptide is now released and can go on and start doing its job or be further processed that the Golgi apparatus packaged up in a vacuum, a, a vesicle. And so then the different parts come apart, the small, large, large subunit and the mRNA, and those things will be reused or recycled or whatnot. As we alluded to earlier, when you have a transcript and mRNA made, you can have several ribosomes moving along that mRNA, making several copies of the polypeptide, so can make the process more efficient. So, translation. Now, for the most part, things seem to work out fine, but sometimes you can have mutations in the DNA, and when you do have those mutations, it gets transcribed into an RNA with that mutation, and then that can result in a, through translation, in a defective protein. So under the scenarios we're going to look at here is, or, and so here's an example with hemoglobin. So there's a particular codon and hemoglobin that's basically a CTT, and it's translated into, or transcribed, I should say, into GAA in our mRNA, and then that will be translated into um, glutamic acid in our um, protein. We can see here we've got this mutation from CTT to CAT, and so it's just a single base, but now it is the middle one, so that's likely to be important when we look at the genetic code, and indeed this now translates from GAA to GUA is the codon, which now is coding for valine in the protein. And this is one of the primary genetic mutations that leads to sickle cell anemia. The single base change mutating from a T to an A, resulting in the change from glutamic acid to valine, leading to a significant change in the protein and the phenotype of that individual. So let's look at examples of mutations. So here's our wild type or our normal sequence. Uh, the top is our template strand. Here's our normal mRNA transcript. And this is the sequence. This is a really simple example here. Just four amino acids. Our stop codon at the end. And here's an example of where we talked about the other day the fact that you can have um, silent mutations. That is, if you get a change in the third base of a codon, it can sometimes, it's a mutation, but it doesn't show up as a change. So you can see the sequence is the same here in terms of the amino acids. So that's a mutation you don't see, and it's basically relatively inconsequential. All right. Now, however, sometimes these things do make a big difference. So here we have a uh, base pair substitution. So where you would normally have an uh, T in the wild type sequence, we now have an A, which changes our uh, mRNA transcript. It changes it from an AAG to a UAG, and so that's a change to a stop sequence. And this is what's known as a nonsense mutation, when you have a stop sequence showing up sooner than it should. And so essentially this protein is going to be missing amino acids. And that is likely to be very problematic, particularly the sooner it happens on the uh, polypeptide. Now, frame shifts. So when you have insertions or deletions, you have what are called frame shifts. That is, you shift the reading frame of the DNA and the RNA. So whereas up here we have AUG, AAG, UUU. Here we have UAG, UAA, because we've inserted an extra base here in our DNA, which results in an extra base in our mRNA. And so now everything has basically been shifted down one, and it just so happens this one also results in the coding of a stop sequence. That's not necessarily the case with a frame shift mutation. Because here, we see a frame shift that, in which we have a missing base, and now an A is missing, which means we have a missing base in our 
mRNA. And so now it doesn't result in a, in a nonsense mutation that is adding a stop, but it simply changes the sequence of amino acids from where the mutation occurs on down. So these insertions and deletions can lead to, or lead to what are called frame shifts, and that can result in a, a um, nonsense mutation where you have a premature stop or just an altered amino acid sequence. All right, and here this shows a type of deletion where you're deleting a, essentially a whole three three bases from the DNA, which essentially means you're missing a whole codon equivalent, basically from your mRNA, and so now we just have a missing uh, amino acid in this protein. Now there are particular compounds that are known to be mutagenic, and that is they cause changes to the DNA. And you may have seen these symbols before. They show them on particular chemicals when you buy them, or you might even sometimes see it on trucks traveling down the road if they're carrying some particular cargo. And so in the boxes, the blue is health, red is fire, yellow is instability. And the higher the number, the more risky it is. That is, the more flammable it is, the more explosive it is, or the more deadly it is to human health. So I picked out one that I'm familiar with just because it's used in biotech labs a fair amount. It's called ethidium bromide, and it's a, a compound that helps stain DNA very nicely. Unfortunately, um, ethidium bromide is mutagenic, and that is it causes mutations to DNA, which is, and I just clipped this right out of the Wikipedia page, it can result in problems in DNA replication and then transcription and ultimately translation. And so you can see ethidium bromide in the, it's not, doesn't really, it's not flammable, it's not explosive, but it is very dangerous to human health. And so labs that use this stuff, you have to be very careful with it and dispose of it properly because you don't want to expose yourself to it. Um, and there are lots of other things. You know, there are certain compounds in, in the cigarette smoke that are mutagenic. Again, they can cause changes to the DNA and cells inside your lungs, which can lead to skin cancer. And UV, UV light can be is considered a mutagen as well because it can damage uh, the DNA in your skin cells. Um, okay.